Welcome to today's webinar, Making Engineering Welcoming and Accessible for Students with Disabilities with Dr. Cheryl Bergstaller, Dr. Kat Steele, and Dr. Maya Kikmek. My name is Greg Nagy, and I am from The Ohio State University and provide technical support for the STEM Equity Pipeline Project along with Freda Walker. Before we start the presentation, I would like to go over some housekeeping items for this webinar. This webinar is scheduled to last roughly one hour and is being recorded in order to view this presentation in its entirety later. The recorded webinar will be available in the next few days on the NAEPEquity.org website. As you've already found out, you'll be watching the presenters present slides through the Adobe Connect interface while listening to them talk over your computer speakers or your phone. You'll also be able to interact using the chat pod. All of the participants' microphones and telephones have been automatically muted. If you would like, you can make the presentation larger for just your screen by clicking the full screen button at the top of your Adobe Connect window. Click it again to return to the normal screen. You can download resources from the Documents to Download pod. Click the file you want to download, then click on the Download Files button. This will open the file as a link in a different tab in your browser. The presenters will answer most questions after the presentation. However, we can take questions at any time. This is how we take questions. At any time during the presentation, you may submit a question by typing your question in the chat pod at the bottom of your Adobe Connect window. We will read and respond to these questions at the end of the presentation. I would like to start the webinar by introducing Freda Walker, consultant for the STEM Equity Pipeline Project. Freda? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thanks. Welcome, everyone. Looks like we're going to have a good turnout for our webinar. And I want to thank Greg for his technical assistance in supporting us. And also uh, tell you that the National Alliance for Partnerships and Equity uh, is funded um, to do this project through the National Science Foundation. We have archived webinars. If you go to the NAEP.equity, I mean the NAEP.org site, website, you can look at any of the past webinars that relate to various topics for females in STEMs or underrepresented populations and equity issues. Um, we have a certificate of completion that you can fill out. At the end of this webinar, you can fill out a survey that uh, gives us some response about what you felt about the webinar today. And then uh, when you complete that, a certificate of completion will, uh, you can be downloaded and you can fill that out if you're trying to get units, uh, continuing education units. We also have a resource document and I'm going to encourage everyone to look to the right to where the resource documents are. And you can download, one is about NAEP and the services that we provide and the other one is about the webinar today. And it has contact information for your presenters. We take questions and answers at the end because we're recording the presentation, but you can type all your questions into the chat function. And when you do that, then we will have the um, presenters respond to that, to, the, to your questions. They can also do it throughout the webinar if they happen to look at the chat. Today's goals are to gain an understanding of access engineering and the strategies to better serve a diverse student body, to learn methods to integrate great disability related and universal design content into engineering courses and to become familiar with strategies to make engineering labs and maker spaces accessible. I'd like to turn our webinar now over to our presenters. Cheryl? Thank you. Can you hear me? Sure can. Thank you. Yeah. Now you get your webcam go if you get your webcam yeah. going, we'll be ready. Okay. I think we're ready. I cannot see your webcam. Have you turned it on? There we go. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're here in rainy Seattle. I mean, some people think it rains here all the time, but it really doesn't. But it is really raining here today. So we're happy to all be together in one office, nice and cozy in here, and a lot of rain pouring on the windows outside. I'm Cheryl Bergstaller. I direct Accessible Technology Services. And I'll be speaking with Kat Steele, who's an assistant professor in mechanical engineering, and Maya Kakmak, who's an assistant professor in computer science and engineering. We're all at the University of Washington uh, in Seattle. And we're going to tell you about the project that we um, are have been working on. 
called Access Engineering. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about why should we care about students with disabilities getting into engineering. We'll talk about different approaches, accommodations versus universal design, and making engineering labs and maker spaces and curriculum accessible to students with disabilities, and incorporating universal design in curriculum, and even share some resources with you at the end. So let's take a poll here. Um, what role do you play in education? I saw the earlier polls and have some sense of that. Um, but if you can enter uh, the poll to say whether you're a K-12 educator, I see we have a number of those, post-secondary faculty, an administrator, university staff, uh, even others. Uh, so already it's, it's pretty clear we have a real mix of people from looking at this poll, but also the one that was done before the uh, presentation, a lot of people from post-secondary education, but also representing faculty, administrators, um, support staff, um, and so on. OK, well, that looks pretty interesting. So we're going to uh, have the presentation uh, meet multiple needs, whether you're teaching in a classroom, whether it's K-12 or post-secondary, um, or whether you're an administrator, you should find something that you can benefit from here. So we have uh, two partners uh, in the Access Engineering Project, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. And one is uh, the College of Engineering um, through um, at the University of Washington, uh, both uh, mechanical engineering and uh, computer science. Um, and we have uh, the Do It Center, which is what I direct as part of Access Accessible Technology Services, which stands for Disabilities, Opportunities, Internetworking, and Technology. Uh, we work with the faculty leadership team uh, from 12 different schools, and so we get a nice uh, broad audience as we create materials that will be accessible and, and useful in various um, situations. So what are we doing in Access Engineering? Well, we're aiming to ensure that engineering programs and resources uh, better serve a diverse student body that includes students with disabilities. Sometimes we talk about women and minorities and kind of forget this group as an underrepresented group as well. And to integrate disability related and universal design content within the curriculum. We have an online community of practice where we work with um, people who are interested in uh, supporting that goal. We do provide small mini grants to institutions. You can look on our website for that to fund some projects that support our goal. Uh, goals and objectives, and then resources on our website. So we're working on uh, serving a more diverse student body that includes students with disabilities, and then in integrating relevant content uh, within, within engineering uh, curriculum. But why engineering? Um, I'm going to move the, uh, this to uh, Maya, and she'll talk a little bit about uh, why it's important in engineering and some statistics related to that. Hi everyone, this is Maya Chakmak. Um, so uh, the Access Engineering project is actually not the first project um, that Cheryl has been working on. When she approached us, she had already been working with uh, Richard Ladner for about 10 years on a project called Access Computing, and they had been having a lot of great impact in computing. Um, but when she told us about trying to do the same for engineering, it was uh, very natural for us, uh, and we said, uh, we were on board right away. Uh, why? Because engineers solve everyday problems that impact um, the whole society and their uh, ideas of projects or important problems to work on is largely impacted by their uh, life experiences. So the larger uh, diversity and the views of engineers, uh, the more problems uh, of this society are going to be represented in the, uh, uh, among the problems solved by engineers. And uh, when we talk about diversity, especially in engineering, usually the first thing that comes to mind is gender diversity, uh, more recently race. But uh, we strongly argue that disabilities should be on the table and is one of the important dimensions of diversity. Um, as a person uh, with disability, why is an engineering career uh, a great option? Um, well, first of all, if you are an engineer, you know that helping solve challenging problems is very exciting and um, is very satisfying. 
uh, but also in our experience working with um, uh, students with disabilities, we, saw, we see that they are great problem solvers because they are facing challenges in the, their everyday lives and they're used to um, uh, solving problems, coming up with uh, creative solutions to problems. Um, of course, uh, one advantage is also that a lot of engineering jobs come with accessible and flexible work environments, uh, good salary and health care. These are uh, some of the advantages. But what I also just mentioned, that we need the diversity. And um, a lot of uh, people with disabilities will find that their views are really appreciated in an engineering field. Um, So some statistics um, related to disabilities. Um, this is based on a report by the NSF uh, from 2015. 12.6% um, uh, of the US population has a disability. This is reported uh, disability. 4.3% um, of undergraduates uh, uh, with disabilities major in engineering. This is a slightly smaller number than those among uh, without students without disabilities, so 5.1%, um, and 6.1% of engineering doctoral recipients have a disability. Um, 59.1% of uh, science and engineering doctoral students uh, with disabilities are female. This is similar to the number 55.4% uh, among students without disabilities. And 17.4% of science and engineering doctoral students with disabilities utilize personal or family funds as their main source of support. This is a slightly larger number uh, than those among uh, folks without disabilities. So more people with disabilities are having to use their own resources to be able to get a degree. Um, in terms of the types of disabilities, 94% uh, uh, without disability, um, around 1% with hearing disabilities, 1.1% vision difficulty, 3.7% uh, cogn cognitive difficulty, 1.4% uh, 1 1 ambulatory difficulties, 0.8% self-care difficulties, and 2.3% independent living difficulties. These are, again, uh, the reported numbers. One of the biggest challenges is actually getting these uh, statistics. And one thing to remember is that a lot of these, these disabilities are invisible. So what are some of the barriers uh, that people with disabilities face when they enter uh, engineering uh, education? Uh, the first one is, um, as Cheryl always says, it's uh, having low expectations from oneself. And the society is to blame for this a little bit. But these are what we call attitudinal barriers, thinking that they're not good enough to be in an engineering field and not um, sort of expecting to be successful in an engineering field. But of course, um, uh, this is we can do a lot about this. There are some more um, uh, uh, physical and uh, environment-related uh, barriers, so access issues that uh, could be related to our classes or our environments that uh, could be addressed, and health challenges that um, sometimes are um, uh, responsibilities of the uh, institution uh, according to ADA, um, uh, but um, might also fall on to the educators to address. Um, of course, uh, we all know the importance of role models, um, and uh, there is no lack of role models uh, of successful engineers uh, with disabilities. Uh, I'm not going to go into any of these stories, but uh, as we will point out later, we have many uh, biographies of um, engineers with disabilities as part of our resources. Um, and we have some publications that uh, we can share if you want to share with your students. What can we do? Um, we are going to get to some of these in more detail, but uh, as educators or even if you're a professional engineer, uh, you could do mentoring, uh, offer internships specifically for uh, students with disabilities, um, Self-advocacy, this is uh, something we can teach people with disabilities besides uh, trying to change the attitudinal barriers. Um, uh, building awareness among educators and employers, uh, this is what we try to do with this webinar, but also as a general um, goal of our project. Um, ensuring that programs for underrepresented 
groups are welcoming and accessible. Um, and this is something we can also do in our classes, uh, making sure the classroom environment is welcoming and accessible, that our websites are accessible for different disabilities. Uh, and um, the uh, minimal requirement is to have accommodations for different types of disabilities. But we are uh, in a little bit going to talk about universal design. The better, the more universal uh, our classes, uh, the, the less need are go you're going to have for accommodations. Um, and it's going to be not just better for people with disabilities, but for everyone in the classroom. I'm going to pass it back to Cheryl now to talk a little bit more about universal design. to make sure your microphone is working. I cannot hear you. We'll just wait for a minute till they get their microphone figured out. Thank you. Cheryl, I still cannot hear you. Oh, maybe now. Let's see. Give it a try. Um, Cheryl, will you speak? Just test it, please. I still cannot hear you. All of a sudden. There you go. Can you hear uh, Try again. I think we've lost a little connectivity, so let's just hang together until Did they get back know? on. Did you plug it there? We don't know. Stopped. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes, you're back now. Wow. A little blip on the internet, I think. Yeah, because nothing happened here uh, that's different. Well, some of you are very familiar. Some of you are somewhat familiar, and that seems to be the most popular thing, and some not at all. So accommodations is what we're used to providing uh, for students in our classes. Uh, uh, sometimes you get a letter from the Disability Services Office or you're visited in person to say what you need to do. So those are alternative formats, uh, service, and adjustment, or technology that's generally provided for one specific individual. And we're required to do this by the Americans with Disabilities Act and other laws in our educational systems. Universal design uh, incorporates accommodations when they're necessary, but it starts first at the designing the product or environment to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So the idea is to be proactive in design so that you anticipate that um, individuals with disabilities uh, will be in your class. So some examples of accommodations, sign language interpreters, uh, providing materials in Braille, electronic format, large print, for giving, giving students extra time on exams. Um, and all of these examples apply universal design principles. Equitable use, flexibility, make things simple, intuitive, um, make sure that information is perceivable, uh, regardless of your sensory capabilities. For instance, your ability to see. Uh, tolerance for error. We all know what it's like to be on a computer system where it's not very tolerant of our errors and doesn't point us in the right direction. Uh, low physical efforts, um, uh, unless you're trying to treat, uh, to teach someone to uh, uh, develop some skills in the physical arena. And then size and space for approach and use, so some of the physical things. What it boils down to is being flexible and having alternatives for people to get, gain information and to uh, apply information.
So universal design is proactive where accommodations are reactive. Um, universal design is broadly based where disability is more focused on one individual. And the benefit to the group um, as far as accommodations, they tend not to benefit the rest of the group where universal design is designed to benefit everyone in the class. So if we kind of zero in on instruction, um, we can look at class climate and it includes things like just welcoming every student, making them feel that they're welcome in your class and you're glad that they're there, including students with disabilities. Interacting, promoting uh, effective communication. Uh, for example, if there is a student in the class that's using a sign language interpreter to uh, make sure that all students can uh, communicate effectively with that student, including um, stating their name when they're going to uh, speak a comment uh, so that person knows who's speaking if they're looking at their sign language interpreter. Making sure the physical environment and products in IT are fully accessible. In the case of IT, that means that a person who's blind and using a screen reader that's speaking to them, the content on the screen, every, all of your IT, like websites, is accessible to that person so they can read the content. In the delivery methods, to be thinking about the many types of diversity that might be in your course, including different types of disabilities, and provide some cognitive supports, like maybe uh, uh, guidelines on how to take notes or how to do um, a certain experiment for people that are, um, that are not maybe as comfortable with that type of format. And, and providing that in written form as well. Multiple delivery methods, so you don't always lecture, you don't always have discussion groups, you don't always do things online, you do a multi-dimensional multi, multi things, multiple um, options for delivering your content and having people um, reporting what they've learned. Using visual aids, tactile aids, giving feedback and assessment, making sure that you give re regular feedback rather than one big feedback at the end in terms of a uh, final project or exam. Make expectations clear and in writing, and giving students multiple ways to demonstrate what they've learned. Uh, more examples are accessible websites, um, captioning videos. Uh, videos that are captioned benefit not just students with hearing impairments, but individuals who are English language learners, people who don't uh, know the spelling of the words that you're using in a lecture, um, and so on. So it's a good example of universal design benefiting all students. Making sure that the syllabus has clear statements of course expectations um, and making them clear enough that a student with a learning disability might be able to start working on their assignments early if they anticipate it's going to take longer for them to complete them than other students. Avoiding unnecessary jargon and when you want to use jargon or acronyms be sure that you fully explain them. Um, imagining that a student might not be from this country and might not understand some of the jargon that you're using or the terms that you're using or they might be less familiar with the field that you're talking about than some students in the class. Uh, providing instructions both orally and in writing or on email and making specific concepts relevant to individuals with diverse characteristics. So now we're going to go back to uh, talking more specifically about engineering. And so we'll from Kat. All right. Hopefully you all can hear me after that transition. This is Kat Steele from University of Washington's Mechanical Engineering Department. And I really like bringing that introduction to accommodations and universal design because we have found universal design to be a powerful framework to help us create a more inclusive and welcoming environment, both in engineering, um, but also for our campus more broadly. And so in the last 25 minutes that we have together, I'm going to be discussing some of the strategies that we've been using specifically to make engineering more accessible uh, and welcoming to a diverse student body. I've picked out a couple of examples, first of all, of spaces that we've been working on, uh, because oftentimes the first thing we think about is, well, can they get in the door? Can we have a space that is um, welcoming to really uh, individuals with diverse abilities uh, and supports our diverse campus? And then I'll close with a little bit in terms of how we've been thinking about not only creating more accessible and universally designed spaces, but integrating these topics into our coursework so that hopefully we're training all of our students and our colleagues and future professionals um, to help us uh, create a more accessible world in general. So hopefully there's some tools and tricks in these examples that I've pulled out that will be uh, of use to all of you in your environments um, wherever you are, since we do have such a diverse audience today. 
So first of all, one of the places that I'm going to start, because it's one of the spaces that I had questions about most often when I shared with our colleagues what we were working on at Access Engineering, is the space, and especially when we look in the educational arena, a lot of people often assume that the space and the activities and a lot of the team-based hands-on things we do are necessarily barriers to incorporating individuals with diverse abilities into engineering. And so here in Seattle, we have a lot of great examples um, that that's not the case. One of my favorite is Seattle's Lighthouse for the Blind, which for decades has trained blind machinists. But still, just a starting place for us has been looking at, well, what are those spaces? Engineering labs, machine shops, electronic shops, and what can be done to make those spaces more accessible? So hopefully you'll find some analogies here with whatever spaces that you're working in. And this is an activity that we initially did as a group and that I encourage you all um, to do. It makes, if you're a teacher, it makes for a great class activity or even an outreach activity. But visiting spaces and bringing a lens of accessibility and universal design of those spaces is a great way to get students and your colleagues thinking about um, creating a more welcome and inclusive environment. So we went around with a group of both students and community members with diverse abilities and visited a lot of those spaces that make engineering potentially um, unique and challenging to navigate. That included our machine shops, our um, labs. We have a lot of hands-on labs in engineering, fluids labs, dynamics labs, material testing labs, um, a lot of electronics labs. Um, and it was a great experience both to uh, introduce a lot of the students with disabilities uh, to the different options available to them, but it also brought a lot of insight to our group. There were a number of general observations that I'd like to share with you from these activities. Um, we do know that in engineering, as in many fields now, that team-based inquiry is really um, a hallmark. And so our students and our community members, first of all, were excited about their experiences entering into these engineering spaces. They saw that uh, working in a team uh, can actually, in, in and of itself, overcome a lot of the barriers. And there's strategies that we're not going to touch on today, but that are on our website, in order to make sure that teams work well together in terms of making sure that everyone can contribute and still learn the material while um, making sure that they can be playing to their strengths. But first of all, there were also other positives that uh, we observed as we were touring these engineering labs. One was that we're moving in a computer-based direction. And so a lot of the traditional tools, um, such as mills and lathes, I'm in mechanical engineering, um, that often would have been seen as big barriers to students completing their curriculum, have been replaced by computer-aided design and manufacturing platforms. When we think about universal design, things such as CNC, computer numerically controlled machines, or 3D printers, additive manufacturing, whatever you want to call it, um, as well as some of the softwares that we use, such as LabVIEW, that provides a platform for virtual instruments, actually make a lot of our environments much more welcoming and inclusive, because now if you can access a computer, you can not only do a lot of your design and testing, but also your fabrication. Um, so especially for individuals with um, impaired motor abilities or who are blind, there's even a whole CAD, the computer-aided design um, software that's accessible um, for individuals who are blind, for example. And so there was a lot of excitement just around all the tools and advances that we as engineers love, but that also make our field more welcoming and inclusive. We, of course, also found lots of potential barriers and different strategies that could help make our space more accessible. Um, wire management is always a challenge. Um, and also making flexible workspaces. We love now that you can buy these sit-stand desks from Ikea, you know, for four to $500. Uh, that can make a space much more accessible to lots of different individuals. Um, we also saw lots of equipment on wheels so that uh, things could be moved around to make the space more accessible. But these are just general observations that we were able to find by touring around and getting the opinions and engagement of a really diverse community. Um, also going back to the framework that Cheryl introduced, um, 
there were both recommendations that we would classify potentially as accommodations, things that you're going to be doing specifically to target and assist someone with a disability, and also great examples of universal design where providing those solutions helps a much wider um, population of your users. Um, so examples of accommodations are things such as um, having microscopes or lenses that can assist with um, seeing uh, things like a small circuit board, for example. Um, providing preferential seating or special seating within an auditorium. Uh, and, but those examples of universal design, such as providing multiple forms, again, of written verbal instructions that are accessible on computers or in a variety of formats, um, having wide aisles and those uncluttered environments can make uh, spaces much easier for all involved, adjustable height work surfaces. Um, and also another big one in engineering that we talk about a lot is safety. And so things such as visual lab warning signals, not just auditory, um, and showers, um, emergency showers that have a variety of heights of uh, on-off switches um, can be very useful as well. Now, I won't go into all of these, you know, it's, I, I bring this up more as an example of something that you can do in your own space and a lens that you can bring whether with your colleagues or with your students or even with an outreach program of middle school or high school students to go in a place and um, get them thinking about how they can create a more universally designed experience. Um, but if you want to learn more specifically about what we found for engineering labs and engineering spaces, on our website you'll see that we've put together a number of different publications that are available on our website that describes and even have checklists that you can use for students to go through and look at First of all, it introduces them to universal design, talks about the different um, aspects of different spaces that are often unique to engineering spaces, uh, labs, departments, um, and then provides a checklist that you can go through and use as a, a start to your brainstorming when you enter a space to think about how can we make this space more inclusive and welcoming. So if this has piqued your interest either as an activity you'd like to do with your students or something that you'd like to do to help make your own environment more inclusive and welcoming, I encourage you to check out um, those resources that you can find on our Access Engineering web space. Now, when I saw everyone coming in, there's one more space example that I wanted to bring in today, and that is maker spaces. Um, I noticed that we had a couple participants here, one from New York City who was a director of a maker space. Um, but we're really excited about makerspaces, not only as um, an example space where we can bring in principles of universal design, but also it just is really enhancing the educational experience of a lot of our students. Um, you know, a lot of our traditional making tools in the machine shop required a lot of safety and oversight, um, while makerspaces are really uh, creating a greater inclusive making community and getting folks um, doing hands-on um, activities earlier in their career. Also for us, it, it's a, a lot of, I don't know how many of you, either your school or your library or somewhere else in your community has either been building a makerspace in the last two years or um, has one planned for the coming year or two. Uh, but it also is a space where we can get in on the ground floor. You know, a lot of our machine shops and other spaces have been around for decades in engineering. And so there we have to go back in and often retrofit and change things. Well, in maker spaces, we can often get in on the ground floor to help provide advice and guidelines to create an even more accessible um, environment. But I guess I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, one of the big questions that some of you may be having, first of all, is, well, what is a makerspace? And sometimes they're um, called DIY spaces or um, a variety of different names. Um, but the big overarching thing is that it brings together space, tools, and typically tools such as 3D printing, laser cutters, sewing machines, um, a lot of uh, tools that you can use to create prototypes and make uh, and craft uh, in a quick and inclusive environment. And the third key piece is community. Um, having an open and engaging space where individuals can engage and get feedback and feed upon one another's ideas. And so hopefully, uh, if you haven't been familiar with a makerspace, uh, you can go and Google it afterwards and find the nearest one near you and uh, to go and take a visit because it really can be a great place to go and 
uh, learn new skills, create a community, make things, get questions answered. Um, I'm sure uh, some of our colleagues here who are from makerspaces could even give a much better description. But when we're thinking about engineering, um, makerspaces have become both a part of our curriculum. A lot of our freshmen and sophomore students take their prototyping classes in the makerspaces before they move into the machine shops. And a lot of them now are coming from high schools that have their own makerspaces. So they come in already knowing about these spaces, these tools, and are more comfortable engaging in design problems. And so as an access engineering group, since in the past two years, we've had three makerspaces open on the University of Washington campus, just the Seattle one. I know there's also some folks here from our Bothell campus. And we did a very similar thing as we did with the labs, is before those makerspaces opened, we viewed the floor plans with a group of high school students um, from our Do It summer program for high school students with disabilities who, had, who knew about principles of accommodations and universal design. We went in and we toured the space, brainstormed what could be made more accessible, and really kind of got in on the ground floor in terms of engaging our community of individuals with diverse abilities into how to make this space work for the broadest group within our campus community. And it led to a lot of really fun conversations. Uh, for example, one of my favorite stories from it was uh, one of our uh, awesome partners who you can see here in the picture uh, holding one of the 3D printed pieces from the lab. Um, she often would loved that everything in most makerspaces on wheels. As someone who uses a wheelchair, she loves when there's wheels on places so that she doesn't really have to worry about aisle management and fitting her chair around spaces. And so she would love to be, she loves spaces where she can move things around and flexibly rearrange it uh, to meet her needs. And also with adjustable tables um, that she can adjust to the height of her wheelchair is very convenient. However, one of our other students that same day um, happens to be, uh, is blind. And uh, as soon as she heard, um, uh, the students say how much she loved the wheels. She said, well, wait a second. I build these virtual maps in my head of where everything in a space lives. When things are in wheels, I'm much more hesitant to enter a space because I can't predict where anything is going to be on a given day or time. And so things that are potentially big accessibility bonuses for one group can also make a place more, less welcoming for another group. And so what these two students discussed was making sure that key equipment within our spaces, like our 3D printers or our soldering stations or our laser cutters, are always in fixed locations. And that any movable things, like our work tables, are also within a known area so that you both have the increased flexibility um, while also enabling those with low vision or other uh, impairments to be able to uh, be comfortable and confident entering the space and using it on a daily basis. So that was a fun part of the conversation and just an example of the types of stories and engagements that we had. And I really encourage you all to try this with your own communities. Uh, they recommended all kinds of things. I just have a few examples here. Um, flexible furniture, as we talked about, having key equipment in fixed locations. Magnifying lenses are useful for everyone. Desk lamps for additional lighting. Um, but two other big pieces was one was quiet spaces. Often we think of maker spaces as big open spaces that are often loud and noisy and often messy. Uh, but for individuals with um, diverse abilities, it's also important to have some of those quiet spaces where um, if, they, if an individual is distracted easily or um, has trouble hearing, that there's still those spaces where you can go and intimately engage with a community or group to get feedback and make sure that you feel comfortable within the space. Another one was training. Uh, people want to be able to go in and engage easily. So making sure that all the training material um, and the methods that they need to for requesting accommodations were really clear. So, um, and I also like to exp uh, just emphasize again why we think that maker spaces are important, not just for engineering. It's a great place for hands-on learning, but also for accessibility. Uh, you probably are familiar with a variety of different communities. Um, 
One is the Enable community, which uh, has been revolutionizing assistive technology for um, assisting individuals with impaired hand function. Uh, this is one of their um, great volunteers who's a who's a, and the original designer of the hand, Ivan Owen, is here at the UW Bothell campus. Um, by having these inclusive spaces, we increase our ability to customize and make designs for individuals with diverse abilities. And so being able to integrate engineering and accessibility, maker spaces are a really natural place for that. So those two slides got switched, so I got a little ahead of myself there. But um, So why is it important to make them accessible? And these are some quotes that actually came from our group of summer students with disabilities. And one of them just pointedly said, make your spaces are often used to help build new assistive technology and increase accessibility. However, many of these spaces and tools remain inaccessible. We need to make sure disabled people can access these spaces and create the products and designs that they actually want. And this is something that comes back to that creativity muscle that Maya mentioned earlier. We find that individuals with disabilities are incredibly valuable to our community because they have to flex that creative muscle often every day and more often if we think of creativity as a muscle. And so uh, entering into maker spaces uh, can just further engage all the users of that space and help to create a more creative environment. Um, another one of our students said, maker spaces are about community. We need to ensure everyone from the community can participate. And that's really been our uh, lens here at the University of Washington as we build and develop these new spaces. Um, is really figuring out how we can create the most welcoming and inclusive environment. Um, we've talked about these lessons before, um, but just to give you an example again of our tool and the uh, big brain brainstorm that came from it, we literally just took one of the whiteboards and you can see what the students were able to come up with in just 10 minutes answering questions like, what are the most accessible features of, the, of this space? Um, how might we improve this space? And there's also a wish list on there. I don't know if you'll see it, things they want, like a kiln and a sanding station and having more left-handed tools. Uh, and so it's a really fun activity to be able to engage students to think about how to make spaces work for the greatest group of people. Um, and very similar to our lab spaces, if this is something that you're really interested in learning more about, we have a full um, set of documents on the website about how making a makerspace uh, guidelines for accessibility and universal design. And like the engineering labs document, it also has a checklist of things that can get your conversation started when you walk in a space. And also if any of you, as you're going through these checklists, come up with additional things that you think we should consider, um, please send them our way. You know, we see all of these documents as living documents. And especially if there's areas that you think we're missing or that really came up in, in as points of engagement um, with people that you may use these documents with, send them our way and we'll add them in. Now the final piece that I want to talk about today, so that's spaces, and we talked about universal design earlier, um, but another piece, as since I know there's a lot of educators here, is thinking about, well, how can we integrate these principles into our curriculum so that we're creating engineers, designers, scientists who have universal design and accessibility within their framework for how they think about their profession so that when they move on in the future, the products and environments they help to make are more accessible. Now, we've seen that accessibility, um, especially in computing, uh, there has been a big movement there in terms of integrating it into the curriculum, such as pro through programs as Access Computing, or now there's the Teach Access program um, from Facebook and Microsoft and Google, where a lot of the computing programs now require accessibility um, as uh, in their job ads and other things. But in engineering, we've seen a lot less of that integration. And we've really uh, moved towards universal design as both a framework and foundation for us to be able to integrate these topics more broadly across the engineering curriculum. Um, and there has been some great works, for example, such as from Kim Bigelow, who's at the University of Dayton, thinking about universal design. But in terms of being able to integrate it into our curriculum, um, it's been a little bit more challenging. But we find that integrating universal design into the engineering curriculum has multiple benefits. Not only do we hopefully um, create more accessible products and environments into the future, but we have seen that universal design, um, that students who are taught about universal design are more likely to consider criteria that increase usability in their design process. And it also tends to 
increase the diversity of students interested in engineering. Uh, Kim Bigelow and others have uh, looked at how individuals from traditionally underrepresented groups in engineering um, engage more with topics that potentially include accessibility and universal design in the, de in the topic. Um, and so we do see universal design as a framework for integrating disability, accessibility, usability um, across the engineering curriculum. And there's a variety of ways that we can integrate um, these topics within the curriculum. Uh, I think the most natural, if you're familiar with the engineering curriculum, or if you're a middle school or high school educator thinking about the classes that are being taught um, within your schools, is thinking about some of those design classes. In engineering, we call them our capstone and our cornerstone design classes. The cornerstone is the class that most engineering students take their freshman year. That's one of their big first intros to design. And capstone is often a year-long class taken in their senior year um, where they uh, go through the full design process using their engineering knowledge. And so these design classes, whatever type of program you are in, or design challenges, are often a really nice place to sneak in topics in terms of universal design and accessibility so that hopefully they get examples um, throughout their curriculum. Uh, when you're, whether you're brainstorming or working with students on a variety of different projects, you can uh, help to introduce them to these principles early. So I know we're running late on t or low on time now, so I'm going to close with a little bit of uh, additional information on what access engineering can help you with. And I will say that this piece on universal design is one of our big focus areas moving forward. Um, we're hoping that we can help to provide modules and other teaching materials that can make uh, incorporating more on accessibility and universal design easier um, for faculty across a wide range of programs. So if that's something that you're interested in, or if you have a wish list, um, we have a group of uh, faculty members working on this now, and so uh, we'd love to engage with you there. Um, but so we've mentioned a lot of resources today, and most of them are available on the Access Engineering website, which we um, will have the link for again at the end. But another one of the big ones I want to mention is on our website, there is the knowledge base that not only has those documents and resources that I mentioned earlier, but a variety of other searchable databases. So for example, there's a Q&A section where basically when everyone, whenever anyone asks us a question that we're not sure about the answer to, we have a great group of students and professionals who work with us who will go in and put in an, uh, a Q&A. So an example might be, are electronic whiteboards accessible to people with disabilities? Um, there's also a variety of case studies. Uh, which we ask a lot of our partners to um, contribute when they find a great solution to a barrier or a different accommodation. One of the ones I love is uh, conference engagement via robot. Uh, we've sent a variety of, through our different programs here at University of Washington, a variety of students and professionals to present their work at engineering conferences where they might not have been able to travel otherwise. And um, we use those tall telepresence beam robots um, and so there's some great case studies on there in terms of the experiences and tips um, for incorporating and using tools like that. And then with a little bit more in depth on the website, you'll also find some promising practices where our partners, um, this here there's one example from the University of Washington's peers program where they include lessons learned and additional materials. Um, peers was for including underrepresented groups in engineering. Um, but the, these promising practices go into a little bit more depth. So if you have a certain topic that you're interested in or curious about, I encourage you to go and uh, search through the Access Engineering Knowledge Base. If you can't find something on there, again, send us a message and we'll make sure that we can um, go and add it to our database. That's how uh, this has grown over time. So you might also be wondering, how can we get more involved? We do see this as an open community and the more folks and partners we can get engaged, the better. Um, we do have a community of practice. Uh, which is an email list. There's ones for students, professionals, educators, um, STEM in general, engineering specific, computing specific. Um, and so you can find more information about how to join those communities of practice um, on the website. We also host a capacity building institute each year. Uh, this year it's going to be April 19th through the 21st here in Seattle. Um, where thankfully with NSF support, we bring out a group of uh, engineering students, faculty, professionals um, for a two and a half day workshop where we talk about 
all of these topics we've talked about today in more depth. And so if that's something that you're interested in applying for and attending this year, we love to see teams of, you know, two people from a university, maybe an engineering faculty, and then someone from the disability services office or some other combination. Um, so if you're interested in April and joining us, we'd love to have you and you can learn more about that on our website. We do also offer mini grants and these are often small amounts of money that can help uh, support a student with disability attend a conference or support an outreach program that's focused on encouraging students with disabilities to pursue careers in engineering. Um, there's been a, many different programs supported and it's really just up to your creativity and so there's more information on that application process online. So uh, we just wanted to say a big thank you for you all today for coming in and joining us. I know that we're just able to brush the surface, so hopefully we've been able to give you enough to whet your appetite. Um, we did, as we mentioned before, Access Engineering is funded by the National Science Foundations. And um, I think I'll turn it back over to uh, the, uh, the team here and we'll gladly take any questions that you have. So thank you. Hello, Kat. This is Freda. This is Freda. Hi. And uh, can you hear me? Uh, we're ready to take yes, questions. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we're ready to take questions. I usually like to ask the questions and then have you all answer them. But one of the things I think I will do, because there are three of you and only one of you is on the headset, is that I'm going to now copy all the questions that came up during the presentation and see if you all can think about how to uh, get those answered. So hold on, I'm going to put them into the, uh, I hope, into the chat that we're all looking at. So here goes. Okay, um, these are, you can see the questions now, they're all mixed together, but they asked the question, how can you tell more about cognitive supports? I mean, can you tell more about cognitive supports? I'm wondering where the boundary is on making recommendations for things like studying, as, you, as Cheryl said. Seems like the students should come to class with their own best strategies. Not sure I feel comfortable making those suggestions, especially since we don't know the nature of the disability. Uh, very good question. Um, uh, the thing to remember about cognitive supports is the students that you would be working with, um, and this would include students with learning disabilities, um, by definition have above or um, average or above intelligence. And so we're not, actually, we're not talking about lowering your standards in your course and so forth. And having taught at the post-secondary level, I would love to be able to assume that all of my students come with really good student, good study habits and so forth, um, but they don't always. So one thing you have to ask yourself and the answer is, is personal. Um, are you going to make a little investment in helping some of the students that maybe are more challenged uh, to be successful in your content? Uh, I like the term uh, scaffolding devices uh, because uh, scaffolding, when we think about it, you put the scaffolding up, you use it for a purpose and then it comes down. And so for instance, since if you're finding in your class that a lot of students just can't seem to figure out how to take notes uh, effectively, uh, you might one time or maybe two times give them an outline of the subsections that you would use for taking notes um, in your class. Another example that actually came up from someone uh, who said that he had a, a student that he thought had an, uh, was on the autism spectrum, had Asperger's because she didn't communicate in class. And uh, she, he was wondering that what she was going to do uh, when they had a presentation required in the next few weeks. And so I, um, I asked him why he assumed that she wouldn't do a presentation very well. He said, well, because uh, she doesn't talk to anybody, doesn't make eye contact. And I said, well, um, what kind of directions do you give the class about their presentation? He says, well, I tell them they have eight minutes. They can do, it, do with it like they, they want. And I said, well, that might be impactful for this person. Um, but also for other students in your class that might be uncomfortable giving a presentation. So maybe we can do as an alternative, not point it out to just give it to this one student, but give an example of one presentation, how you could organize your time, like one minute to introduce yourself and say what the objective is, two minutes to uh, decide your initial steps in your project, and so forth, and at the end give an evaluation. And I saw him uh, later 
And he did make a little outline. He gave it to the staff or of the students. And that student followed it. He says, you wouldn't believe it, Cheryl. It was just like to every every second, practically, was to use this outline. And I said, but did, it, did anybody else use it? And she, he says, yeah, several of the other students use that outline, too. So you have to decide in your own mind. I, I think if I am teaching was teaching an engineering course and um, they were giving a presentation that I'm not giving anything away by helping somebody give a presentation in that regard. But that would be an example of a scaffolding device that you could consider using. Thank you. I'm going to move to the next question. This one, and I don't know if they're in order because I saw how it came up for you and it's pretty hard to read. But for students with social impairments who are more likely to work from home, how likely is it for them to have a career in engineering? I'll uh, answer that one as well. Um, I think one thing for a professor to keep in mind is that we don't uh, guarantee that any of our students will have successful careers in engineering. Um, and so you don't really need to worry, worry too much about that. We always want them to, and so it's it's important that they um, that they can pursue those fields. Uh, for issues like uh, students on the autism spectrum that face challenges in communication, probably the best thing you can do is give is be a good role model and give them opportunities to communicate. Uh, engineering, computer science are often the fear the fields that those students do have um, the most success in actually. Um, but uh, giving students opportunities to communicate in groups and requiring that they all communicate and kind of monitoring that and giving them some scaffolding devices on how to do that effectively is important. Um, students on the autism spectrum, and we work with quite a few of them, um, really benefit from practicing uh, communication. So sometimes just telling them specifically what you want um, will solve the problem. Um, and hopefully then some of that will translate into their careers. So giving them practice while they're, they're still in school is probably the best thing that you do. Thank you. Here's the next question. Is there an age limit for the students with disabilities to enroll in an engineering course? An age limit. Are we talking about uh, post-secondary? I'm not sure, but uh, maybe you can just give no. some insight on the post-secondary part. Oh, OK. <laughs> I can just say in general that we have students uh, across the age spectrum. Um, I always love to give my mom as an example who went back after teaching high school math for 20 years and got her engineering degree at the age of 40. And so. Um, in our class, you know, like any other university program, we see that the majority of our students are between 18 and 25 years old. But uh, one of the great things about engineering is that we do have um, a lot of opportunities for folks across their career spectrum. And I would suspect that there are um, high school programs and junior high programs that uh, have strategies or courses that are focused on engineering. So that would even take it down into lower ages, too. Uh, this is the next question. I'd like to know more about the awareness of different abled, differently abled visitors. OK, during our mini fair, maker fair, one visitor complained about children running amok and disturbing her children. I watched the children in question and approached the parent to advise him that a visitor complained and could he keep his children within sight. Oh, boy, did he get upset and asked me who could complained, said he was watching his children, that they were autistic. This was a very awkward situation, sometimes I have not uh, encountered before. I'd like to learn how better to be considered of all visitors. And I think that that's a great example that the more we can bring accessibility and diversity topics to the community in general, in t the more um, just welcoming and forgiving and considerate we tend to be as a community. And so I think uh, I don't, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl in a second. Um, I don't have specific advice for that situation, but I think it really points to the need that um, we need more folks to consider the diversity of human ability and in general it leads to greater patience and compassion. I'm going to let Cheryl add it. I think you also have to keep in mind that sometimes um, it isn't a disability related issue even though someone uses a disability related word. So in that case if there was uh, some reason why um, 
well, there's a complaint actually, but if they you felt that the children were providing a disturbance, um, you might, as you engage with that person, they didn't need to share with you they had a disability, by the way, um, to deal with that issue. You might ask them, how can we help, um, uh, you know, make this this uh, environment more safe for other people or to keep them more contained in a certain way. Kind of throwing it back on them just saying what would you like us to do? How we, how can we facilitate this? But um, it shouldn't be a different converse, a lot different conversation than if that disability wasn't mentioned. That it is reasonable in an environment for children to 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 meet and adults by the way certain standards of behavior and so you need to just keep talking about the behavior and if it's bothering other people. One time, sometimes disability does come up though and it is totally inappropriate um, where see people complain because a student with say Tourette's is uh, speaking out or, or uh, saying words kind of randomly or using a barking sound or whatever and in those cases then it's important that you inform the people that are complaining that that's a disability related issue. Um, but again, I think you'd focus on the outcome and what can we do to uh, make sure everybody is fully served in the environment. Thank you. Uh, this is going to be our last question. Uh, could Universal Design be helpful in nursing programs to help a variety of students with disabilities be successful? A concern that college staff has is that certain students, like those restricted to wheelchairs, do not attend. It would not be in a nursing program. Um, I cannot accept that assumption quite yet. Well, sometimes people with uh, disabilities, certain types of disabilities, may not be in the typical nursing situation, but there might be a place for them in that career field. Uh, we had a, a young woman years ago graduate with a PhD in atmospheric sciences here at the university, and she was totally blind, and people were kind of giving her pushback on that. Well, how you can't even see clouds. How could you uh, major in that field? Well, she knew exactly what she wanted to do. She was a brilliant mathematician. She had full technology that gave her access to mathematics, and she wanted to analyze climate trends. And so there's a field there. Uh, many fields in, in that or jobs in that area might not be accessible to her. But what she's doing is, and now she works as a postdoc at, at NOAA analyzing climate trends. So, so sometimes it's important to, I mean, it's important to consider the disability, but look at various um, career fields where um, someone might be able to uh, participate. And I'm going to add on to that one. Also, um, as in what my background is an engineer working in hospitals and I'll say we need an access medicine program or something um, additionally because not only in nursing but also we talk to a lot of MDs where um, a lot of those professions aren't accessible right now and are actually ex explicitly exclusive to individuals with disabilities. We have great examples of, for example, doctors with disabilities but the majority of them um, uh, had an accident or other thing that led to their disability after they already had their MD degree. And so some of the CPR and other requirements, there hasn't been a lot of creativity around how we can uh, diversify a lot of our clinical professions as well. And we know that we need more nurses and um, there's just like engineering, there's a huge spectrum in terms of what those folks do on a daily basis that can make it more inclusive and if you go into a hospital I think many of us will agree that hospitals in general could benefit a lot from universal design principles so who's ever from the nursing field uh, go forth and conquer <laughs> oh thank you and this is a question that a variety of people have asked is if they could have um, your content uh, your PowerPoint um, presentation. I don't normally send them out, but uh, if you all can consider that and let me know, then if so, I can send it out. And you don't have to do it online right now, but you can just think about it and let me know. Um, I yeah, that's am going to... uh, fine. Oh, it's okay. Okay. Yeah, then we'll fine send if you it send out, out as... the PDF of our slides. Yes, uh, I have I, on the handout. They can find web the links and some of the information, but that they want some of them wanted your PowerPoint, so we can do that as a follow up. And I'll also mention um, there's this. If you're curious more about Universal Design and Higher Education, um, one of our other programs with Cheryl, uh, Cheryl has put together this of other great tools for incorporating Universal Design and Education, and this is available. Um, from the Harvard Education Press too, um, and is also pieces available on the website. So, sure. Okay, so 
Uh, oh my gosh, this person is leaving. Don't go yet. But they have been asking about, um, you know, how you, uh, well, I don't know if we can get it answered today. It's too much. But anyway, I'm going to go on and finish my, uh, my presentation about NAEP and conclude the webinar. I appreciate all the different um, questions that people had. And there's been a good discussion from one person about how um, disability fits into diversity. So uh, that's probably a whole nother topic to take on. Thank you all. Um, I just want to say that this is, uh, webinar has been sponsored by NAEP. We provide professional development, uh, research and evaluation, technical assistance, and public policy advocacy. Uh, there are a variety of our ser uh, services and resources that you can see here. You can go to our website to uh, find more detailed information about them. Um, we have uh, services that come in person, we have some that come in hand, uh, printed, and we have some that come online. Uh, we have turnkey implementation toolkits, and we will have a new one coming out this spring and probably one this summer. Uh, we do have a virtual learning community, so please go to napequity.org to find more information. And I want to thank our presenters. Cheryl, Kat, and Maya. Also Greg for his support behind the scenes. Thank you for participating and we're going to let you uh, give you the survey and you can download a, a certificate of completion. Greg, you're on. So well, now I'm going to click on this link to open the survey for everyone. And what it should do is open a link in um, a new browser tab for you right now. If it doesn't, you can go click on this uh, under the key links pod where it says webinar ev evaluation survey and open it yourself or copy and paste the URL. If you don't have time for that right now, I will be sending out this URL through the email later. Um, and just a reminder that this uh, webinar will be archived at the napequity.org website probably tomorrow. And we want to thank everyone, and this is the end of the webinar. Thank you.